Um, good morning, Brent Griffin. Good morning, Sandra. <laughs> good evening, students. Welcome again to another interesting lecture today with the, within the frame of the module Emerging Fields in Architecture. Today we welcome Brent Griffin. Brent Griffin is a space architect, but he is also the program manager for a single person spacecraft at Genesis Engineering Solutions. And before joining the company Genesis, he supported NASA's Advanced Concepts Office at the Marshall Space Flight Center. There he participated in the analysis and design of lunar bases and deep space habitats. Formerly, he has worked with Boeing as the lead configurator for Space Station Freedom and as Habitation Module Manager. Brent Griffin has architectural degrees from Rice University and Washington State University. He also has a Master of uh, Fine Arts from the California Institute of Arts. And besides his research and technical work, Brent does really beautiful architectural and engineering drawings, which I hope you have the chance to see in a few minutes. Um, thank you, Brent, for joining us today. And it is a pleasure to hand the micro over to you now. Welcome. Okay, thank you, Sandra. And, uh, you know, uh, spent some time in Austria. It's a beautiful country. And two years ago, my wife and I had a river cruise. And, she loves Vienna. It's her favorite city. And that's easy to understand because she loves music and she loves food. So and that's a great place to be. But um, Vienna is a, a really special place in the world. And I want to thank you, Sandra, because you inspired me to put together a different way of presenting this material. So this is the first time that I presented it. And knowing that there are architecture students and not just space university students, yeah, it includes a lot of other things. So I'll go through a lot of charts and then we can talk about them at the end. I want to say a little bit about the title here, uh, different for a reason. Um, a lot of times we make decisions and uh, they may be arbitrary, but it's good to be intentional. So this developed over the years and I don't want to confuse different from being better, you know, because Sometimes choices are equal, but we should have some reason for selecting one over the other. Um, and I'll go ahead and start this. And, um, and let me see. I am going to stop my video here simply because I want you to focus on the charts. Uh, these three images represent uh, a little bit about what I'm going to discuss. The first one on the left, uh, during World War II, the Germans wanted to be able to come up with an observation aircraft. And if you're sitting right on the fuselage, it's hard to see over the right or the left, forward or aft. So they put the cockpit out on the wing. And you wonder, wow, how could that make it up, any organization, and let alone be built? And it flew, you know, so that's pretty amazing. You know, we think of an airplane as being like a bird in its form, you know, symmetrical. This is an asymmetric aircraft. Another uh, representation of that is in uh, the pipe organs. Uh, actually, my wife played the pipe organs. She loves them. But in the Disney Center, took a little bit different approach. That is a pipe organ in the Disney Center in Los Angeles. And likewise, in going to the moon, um, our images of what that would look like was like a 45 caliber bullet. And yet it ended up being completely different. And it's exciting that it was different, but there's a reason for all of the reasons why uh, that particular spacecraft looks the way it does. So um, I'll talk about some of the uh, involvement that I've had in space, and to bring it back to an architectural level, um, when I found out about neutral body posture, neutral body posture is the form that we take in the weightless environment. Uh, it is when our muscles are all in their neutral state. And 
being an architect, I took that back to the Vitruvian man, what Debussier said, and Dreyfus, all of these other representations of humans in a gravity environment. Now we had something different. We've never had that before. The advent of space allowed us to look at a new modulaire, you know, that you could now take this and do our design work much like you do anyway, but you don't think about it. Now, the reason that came about is that initially we just had capsules and the astronauts were confined to a very small environment. They flew Skylab and there was a big volume. So they had time for the body to adjust and to document. It wasn't like we didn't know that you'd float around in space, you knew that but we couldn't document it. And you can see right here is a photograph of one of the astronauts on the Skylab mission. So to me, that was profound and also influential in terms of looking at how to design for space. Now, we look at uh, kind of a history here of developing spacecraft that take that into mind. And we had uh, Space Odyssey 2001 and that pod, really neat you know, thing, great design and everything. But, you know, the astronauts sitting down in it. Now, we know we float in space, but didn't know how to accommodate that in our movies. So then in 74, we come up with the neutral body posture. I was working at the Johnson Space Center on a fellowship and thought, well, why don't we develop a small single person spacecraft? So this is an early sketch of that. But in the weightless environment, we're still using spacesuits. And you think, well, that's natural. Well, maybe not the right solution. And you can see on the far right there that um, a, we have a spacecraft that is basically wrapped around a neutral body posture. And it's small, lightweight, and the perfect solution for operating in the weightless environment. And this is part of the reason why. Um, it's different because if you walk on the moon or any other planet, you use your legs, you use your legs for walking, you use your hands for tools. In a weightless environment, you use your hands for walking and you use your hands for tools. Your legs don't really provide you much. You can lock yourself into a foot restraint, but they're pretty much useless. That's why we're working on the single person spacecraft. Only we took the person out of the space and put them in that small environment, gave them manipulators, and uh, we used propulsion. The same thing that was on that uh, jet pack that they flew you know, a while back. It's no longer operational. So you use propulsion and you use manipulators. Uh, that's the reason why we're developing that spacecraft. These are some of the early sketches. Uh, and um, you know, I was working with a space artist back then. Um, he was the best, probably still was the best, and he painted things. Now, most all of the space artists have been eclipsed by uh, any of the CAD work, which is fantastic, and we're using that too. But in the past, we depended upon that. He painted this, and I've got the original, and it's just amazing, and you can see that on the wall behind me when I put the camera on, but uh, incredible detail. And he did it because he had a passion for space. And we would do these things after hours, but sometimes he'd get out one, you know, uh, brush with the smallest amount of uh, paint on it. And it's been three months. He basically painted for posterity. He, he knew that these would be uh, great works of art, and they are. This is our spacecraft. And uh, we can fly it with a human in it, or we can teleoperate it. So it provides a lot of capability for doing space work, not only close to the Earth, but around the moon and on the way to Mars. This is an image, and this one happened to be CAD of us uh, on a, uh, a particular program now that's called the Lunar Gateway. We're on a small space station around the moon. And with this spacecraft, you can go where you cannot go in spacesuits. And anybody can fly it and go out for a short period of time. And there are a lot of other physiological reasons why this makes sense. Although in looking at spacesuits, this is one, and you can see that it is different from the ones we typically see. And the reason is, is that we wanted to integrate some of the displays inside. And you can also see um, these times, these structural 
pieces down a little bit lower at the bottom of that torso assembly. All of that plays into how this actually works. Across the top, you see kind of an evolution of spacesuits. Um, you can go from a leotard suit, which was basically a compression suit, very hard to get into and very hard to get out. <laughs> and then the evolution from the Apollo to the shuttle suit, which is still being used right now, to the Russian suit, and then an all metal suit. And then this suit, you can see at the end of all of those. Actually, the faceted helmet allows you to make the glass thicker um, without any distortion. If you have a bubble helmet and you start to make it thicker, it becomes a lens and it distorts your view. So in this way, you can have very thick panes of glass in there that provide excellent visibility and uh, you know, allow us to use areas for putting up displays and controls, like up uh, on the brow piece there. We also designed a different covering that went over the boot. Um, the previous one had little square ridges. There's an opportunity to get uh, small rocks and things embedded in it. With this one, uh, you would not have that. They would not stay in there. This suit um, was contracted by the Smithsonian uh, National Air and Space Museum and was on display for 10 years. Now you see it as a spacesuit, but it's more than a spacesuit. Um, it also is a cockpit. Um, and one of the reasons that we were looking at this is on the moon, the dust is really bad stuff. It's shards of basalt and it's can cause damage to your lungs if you breathe it, and also is uh, very abrasive to any of the components that you have. So on the left-hand side at the top, uh, this is the current suit. It comes apart in a lot of different pieces. Those are opportunities for dust to get inside. Now on the one here that we designed, there's only one opening, and when you're going in and out, you can see that, so you can clean that off. So it reduces the contamination from dust. The other thing is that the center of gravity is uh, more amenable to walking and getting around, especially on the moon in the one sixth gravity. You know, the current one has a backpack that's on the back. So a lot of the mass is, you know, aft. Now, what we did is we wrapped it around and brought it down along those structural elements so batteries and heavy things could be closer to the normal center of gravity. So you'd be able to walk better on the planets. And you can kind of see here, we sculpted out the backpack. So the head actually goes into the backpack area of um, our spacesuit. Now, this is... Um, something that a lot of people don't know, but uh, when astronauts landed on the moon, they were standing up. And it's largely because those spacesuits don't bend very well. <laughs> you know, that they were tethered down and they're able to look out. So you can see this image of uh, one of the astronauts in the lunar module. The other thing is, is that the pressure was so low, the skin was very thin. And you have to go in and out and you have to repressurize it and depressurize it. There's a lot of complexity associated with that. But with this suit, it is the cockpit. You can see on this lunar hopper that the astronaut just climbs up, gets in there, locks in those two metal brackets and then flies it. So what a ride that would be to be able to go and be able to fly this thing around. You, know, the, uh, you don't have to get in and out of a, of a cabin. Again, another one of Paul Hudson's paintings. And uh, this one shows some uh, storage bins below. And you can carry other things as well. And at a point, it makes sense to fly rather than drive. Um, it's tough going on the lunar surface. It's not, you know, improved in any way, so it's really rugged, and you have to go slower because it's 1.6 G, and uh, in this case, you can minimize the consumables, you know, all of the things, the breathing air and, and the batteries, just by flying from place to place. It's another view, another uh, Paul Hudson painting, and uh, you got in through the back, 
uh, we wanted to test that. And we also got Apollo 17 astronaut Jack Schmidt. He was the uh, only scientist, actually a geologist. And he tried the suit on and he liked it. He said it had great visibility. We looked at it in 16G. There's an airplane that, uh, you know, they call the Vomit Comet, and it basically flies up and does parabolas. And as you go over the top, you can adjust the shape of that so that either you're weightless or you're in 16 gravity like the moon. And uh, we were able to fly on that and look at getting in and out of that spacesuit in the lunar gravity. Um, you don't have much time. You have about 30 seconds. And then as you go to the bottom of your parabola, you actually experience 2G. So it's twice what the normal gravity is. But nonetheless, there's not a lot of opportunities here on the Earth to be able to, you know, be in the weightless environment or even simulate it. This painting, I wish you could see it in uh, its full, you know, size and everything. It is phenomenal. This is another one that Paul Hudson did. Uh, it was in the Smithsonian Aerospace Museum. And uh, it shows the Mars version of these suits. Um, and uh, pretty special work of art. Now, another thing, and this is why these things are different. Uh, the lunar lander you saw before and the ones that are planned all have the crew cab up on the top. And there's a reason for that. They want to be able to land and then take off and only have the upper part of it go back up to the return part of the spacecraft. But nonetheless, that presents a problem. Uh, there's a significant height difference between where the crew gets out and the surface. And you have to go up ladders and suits don't work well on ladders. And if you're bringing back any kind of cargo, then you know, you've got to get it up and down those ladders. So uh, the thought in this particular concept, again, it's different for a reason, is that we make it like most, um, let's say, transportation, aircraft, ships, whatever. There is a cargo bay. So this is basically a cargo bay. You put your payload in there, and you have your propulsion elements outboard. Um, we say we can do that. I know propulsion engineer, engineers like centerline thrust is easier to control. But we have two and four engine aircraft that don't have centerline control. So we're able to manage that with uh, software and also having multiple engines. But this is a way of getting the payload close to the surface and allowing uh, easy off on loading. In this configuration, you can see uh, there is a crew cap for the lander. And here's another version of that, again, a painting by Paul Hudson. And um, this one um, in terms of the crew being able to land. Now, that center portion can be anything. It can be any kind of payload. It's right there. And uh, on the outside of this, all of those boxes, they're easily accessed as well. So it's designed for maintenance and designed for uh, ease of operation. Those are the differences. Now, we took it further. Uh, this is a lunar base that basically uses those elements. And uh, again, you don't want to bring a lot of construction equipment to improve your site. And we said, OK, we'll put these little footings down, and then we'll adjust those up so we can make a horizontal reference plane above an irregular lunar surface. The surface doesn't make any difference now. It's very dense anyway. So uh, you know, placing these in the right place should be able to carry the load, especially in the 1.6G. So we establish a reference plane. And then when we bring the modules in, we just move them up into place the same structural load path that they had when they were delivered all the way from the Earth. And when they're connected, they're perfectly aligned because we arrange this uh, in you know, a precision way with all of the elements that are there. The other thing that you really can't see here, but there's a folded plate on the top. Uh, it's very lightweight in order to take, but it will allow us to stack the 
lunar regolith or soil that is there, and that will provide us with uh, radiation protection on the surface. So all of these elements are playing together, um, and you can see why they're different now. We're not going to try to, you know, put regolith on top of the modules. We want to be able to access the modules and put it on top of the structure. This is a Mars lander. Uh, and again, that's a challenge because Mars has just enough of an atmosphere to make it difficult to land and get up, and yet not enough to do the things that we want. Now, we would like to be able to use parachutes, but there's not enough of that atmosphere. So it's uh, more difficult to land where you want to on Mars, and you have to be able to have some aerodynamic and also propulsion. But this is just the concept uh, of a Mars lander. Now, space station, you see it now, and it's the International Space Station, that little image down here. Well, before it was the International Space Station, it was a bunch of other designs. Uh, I started working with Boeing in the early 80s, and we were working on a space station concept. It initially, uh, you know, was one for operations. It has now changed into a different one, but this is an early configuration, and we had a requirement then, much like you do in buildings, where you have to have two means of egress from a room. They wanted to have two means of egress from every module. So it ended up being this kind of racetrack configuration that all the modules were connected to one another. Uh, the current configuration doesn't have that same requirement. This is another later version of it. And uh, this is again, Paul Hudson, uh, you know, when I was working with him, painted uh, the habitation module. We did have a habitation module at one time in the configuration. Uh, we don't now. All we've got is laboratories and we carve out places for the crew to be able to have their crew quarters. But nonetheless, we had a dedicated module for habitation. So it'd have exercise equipment, it had the galley ward room, it'd have their private crew quarters and all of those things in there. This is uh, another image that shows the laboratory module, and we were carrying two different dedicated modules. And part of that rationale goes back to Skylab. When the astronauts were interviewed, uh, they said it was good to separate work from, let's say, off-duty time, like a habitat. So we took that to heart and made two separate modules, but now it's back to just the lab. And I want to show you some of the mock-ups that reflect those stages. On the far left, this is the Space Operations Center when I first started working at Boeing. And you know, I couldn't believe it. You know, I go in there and they're building a full-scale mock-up. We don't do that in architecture. You know, we do it in drawings, we may do it in subscale models. But uh, you know, in the space business, we build full-scale mock-up. Right? I was really impressed with that and continued to work on that. Well, this one went away, and then we had another one. This is looking at the habitation module mock-up, and that was during the Space Station Freedom time. But on the far right, you see the way it is today. And this is just one of the modules, but uh, they're pretty cluttered. Um, and part of the reason is that you're working in the hallway. Uh, it goes right down the middle and all the racks face inward and there's no other choice but uh, uh, to have a lot of the uh, connections uh, between the racks and other things be in that aisle. Um, another opportunity that I had during Space Station was to spend time in the suit uh, in water, which is neutrally buoyant. You're not out of gravity. If you go upside down, the blood still rushes through your head. But, you know, it's a great environment for simulating space operations. And we did this uh, before we actually started building space station. We had a, uh, a simulator for flying the man maneuvering unit, that jet pack. And then we looked at different ways of putting radiators on the outside. And even the first nighttime uh, EVA, they, they're very safety conscious. Every time you have somebody in a spacesuit, there's always two safety divers and utility divers around. And um, the nighttime dive was proposed and it was like, whoa, I don't know, you mean turn out the lights? 
Now, the reason we do that is about half your time is on the shadow side of the earth. So you can't stop working. You have to know how to do it. Now, I want to go into some of the architectural things that are ideally different for a reason. This is a, a project where I was invited to be the curator of an oil and gas exhibit in Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, this is the design sketch. And the concept was to take a cross section from the water where they do a lot of offshore drilling onto the land and up to the refinery, which is inland and be able to try to represent that in this museum. Um, so here we had a, a reference wall. We were able to have different enclosures that represented uh, you know, stages of uh, oil and gas exploration and refinement. And then as a theme, um, when I look back at this, I'm amazed that they did this. Sometimes you propose things that uh, you know, are pretty outrageous, and this thing was. Uh, it, <laughs> it's using the natural gas that was there in Lafayette, Louisiana, and having this representation of uh, the vents. If you drive along the coast of Texas and Louisiana, you'll see oil refineries, and they're burning off, you know, the excess gas. So that's what inspired this. The grid ended up being a reference for showing amorphous forms like a, a blob. And this is the inside, that's that reference wall. And then here you see the grid against a amorphous form, which basically was a way of filtering the light up and down into these uh, small display areas. Now, another one was uh, an addition that I did in uh, Tacoma, Washington. And um, the clients, uh, I did this as a moonlighting job. I was working as an architect in an office and they wanted me to design uh, an addition. And it's pretty obvious what the addition is. It's over here. And they had a rather large house uh, with clapboard siding. And then they had a garage here and they said, we want to connect the two. We want to be able to look out and see our children play and we want a little bit of a concealed entry in there. So the idea was to expand the view by stepping it down. Uh, there's some operable windows here. And also on the top, and this is a little bit different, it serves as a fire escape, if you will, from this back window. You can come out to the front and there are steps in that broken pediment at the top. The other thing in the concealed entry is that there's a way of uh, scraping off your boots and uh, cleaning them before going in. The door has a, uh, a threshold that actually comes up inside the door when you open it. And you can kind of see that there are two different sized lights uh, right there at the entry. So when you look at that now, the, the image on the left is the way it is seen. And then I tried to annotate the one on the right to show you why it's different. So obviously, you know, adults are seen in the taller light and then children in the smaller one, like you can see here. The other thing that isn't obvious, but tried to point out, there's a closet right here and it's open, doesn't have any doors on it. You put your coats in there and I put a heater on the floor. So the heater serves two functions. It warms the jackets and it also warms the room. So you can put it on a warm jacket and go outside. And the heat comes up and it actually goes over the top. So I didn't enclose it. And then also because it doesn't have a door, it would go up there. There's open storage here and it's the wire grate. So you can see, you don't have to, you know, keep on opening things up. You have direct visual, uh, you know, access to any of the storage here. So those are some of the reasons why it looks the way it does. Now at the other end that goes out the back, again, this is pretty small. I had some very tolerant clients on this. <laughs> it was indulgent. Um, you see two doors that basically look the same, but they operate differently. One is for humans. The other one has both ventilation and a pass-through. When you're down below, when you wanna pass plants or anything's back and forth, then you use this lower door 
in order to pass them back and forth. Also in there was uh, a mud room. Uh, I don't know what the equivalent is in German, but basically you come in and you take off your clothes and you know you, you want it to have a fairly resilient floor like a tile floor here. But I again put heaters underneath these bench seats and you can kind of see that represented here. The wainscoting across the back is the same that is in the main house. So you basically can sit on this thing, taking off your boots and kind of warm up your rear end. Um, and then on the right hand side, uh, made a thick wall and actually captured the rainwater and put it into a little cistern that's right here. And the steps that come down on the side here are where you can put plants. They're lined with stainless steel. You use natural rainwater that comes in and there's a spigot in there so you can do that. So not only did it provide good visibility, but it provided an opportunity for you to put plants on the inside and water them with the natural rainwater. Um, they wanted a storage place for um, putting some of their beverages. So this thing ended up to be quite a cabinet work. Uh, you can see that there are touch latches here. You push on those and it opens those out. Then you can also swing them out and expose a lot more. And the top exposes even more storage space. So what serves as a countertop also carries uh, uh, a lot of other beverages in there. A law office in Seattle. Um, the door is formidable. Uh, yeah, it was intended to be that way with uh, bolts and a small uh, uh, light that's in the center. And when you go in, um, I sculpted again the same pattern on the left hand side. The uh, sculpting of the wall is there for a purpose. And it's shown over here that uh, the receptionist then could be able to see sitting down anybody who came in. But the taller portion was scaled for people standing up. So when they went up to talk to somebody and exchange things. So these particular forms are a result of you know, actual functional reasons for doing it. And uh, you know, again, rather formal uh, treatment of the uh, small windows that were there. And, and then the flooring uh, is was made up, uh, it's a linoleum. Uh, and they don't use linoleum much anymore and they didn't use it much then either. But uh, you can cut it and you can shape it. So it worked out very well for creating patterns like this radial concentric pattern. And then in terms of the lights, uh, there was light overhead that kind of spilled down into this two-story space and uh, then kind of a almost uh, corbeling like you do with brick that would represent the stepping as it went up. Since it was a lawyer's office, uh, they had lots of books uh, back then. And rather than doing what was on the left, it was different. And you can see the representation of that here, but this is it in real life on the right-hand side. The ceiling was shaped in order to have the lights go across and illuminate the books, not the floor. So the, the purpose of the lighting was uh, to reflect the books that the lawyers had. And then embraced a little bit different pattern in the upstairs there and uh, this pattern was taken all the way into the conference room light that was in the door there. You can see that uh, the same values are in the stained glass light that was put into the door. And uh, then uh, it's a theme you'll see a little bit later. Uh, I take a wall and I push it and use it on both sides. So this is one of the small offices. And there'd be a desk in front, and this serves as kind of a credenza in the back and a bookshelf on top, as you can see here. But in the hallway, it's a bookshelf on top and bottom because it's a cavity that you can see through. So that is kind of a double function on either side of the wall. Now, um, I'll get you into the house we're living in right now. 
Um, this is it. Uh, this is a, a shot that I took, uh, obviously, at night. And it's really hard because I'm using a, a 35 millimeter camera and trying to adjust the f-stop, put it on a tripod, and try to catch it with no light. But this one worked out OK. It's uh, up on a hill. And the hill it slopes up this way. And this is important, the sun track from morning to afternoon. Um, all of these are uh, pretty much deciduous trees. So they have their leaves in the summer and, and drop a lot of them in the winter. However, a bunch of them stay there. But being up slope, it shades us in the afternoon. And being in northern Alabama, you get pretty hot in the summer afternoon. But we still retain great visibility and uh, we get to see the moon rise and the sunrise and looking east. So, you know, those are some of the features. Also, it uh, parallels the gray. You know, it's, it's hard to build against the gray, and sometimes that's a good architectural statement. But in this case, we wanted to parallel the gray. This is one of the mornings that uh, we had looking out towards the, the hills. And uh, it's just wonderful to be able to see the moon and the sun come up. Little concept sketch uh, early on, and as concepts go, they change, but you got to start someplace. And the intent was basically to have two outer blocks that uh, confine an inner space here, and then maybe have some representation of banding or coining on the outside. So this is the house uh, as it is seasonally, um, straight driveway, very symmetrical. And symmetry is a ruthless master. You know, I had to do interior uh, elevations of every room to make sure that all of those rooms work as well as the exterior. So, um, you know, if you buy into symmetry, you have to do a little bit of extra work. And you can see it, you know, winter, and you can see it in the spring. We have some Yoshino cherries out front. Again, very symmetrical. The entryway has uh, a, a small arch on the top there. And then uh, these are the banding that I had mentioned before. The other thing that I was trying to do is to get these chimneys outboard. A lot of times you can put a chimney in the middle, but then it's hard to put the flashing and all of the stuff for water protection around the outside. So uh, I have them outboard, and then it's called a cricket. It's a little roof-type shape that goes up there. But I was defeated. These still have leaked a little bit, uh, you know, so the water gets in. Lighting was important in terms of being able to locate it. It always is for architects. And this is one of the reasons. On the left-hand side, I'm going to show you the conventional. And this is not just typical to the United States. You know, people put lights right next, by, next to the door. And that's where the bugs come. So when you come up to the front door, you know, the bugs are there with you. In our house, we pulled them away. We put them out front, away from the front door, but it still illuminates the front door. And you can see looking out here uh, how they actually uh, are away from the front door. I do have a light that's there, but nonetheless, the bugs can go where they want to go and people don't have to walk through that. The other thing that's different, and uh, it has to do with how most people go into houses, and uh, I think it's pretty universal, but a lot of times you come in and then you see stairs. Stairs pretty much point to the private part of the house. Uh, they're a wonderful accent piece, and you know, architects have you know, put a lot of effort into designing stairs. But I decided in our house, since uh, we generally drive in the garage and walk in that way and people come in through the front door that we're not going to emphasize the private part of our house what we're going to do is you come up to the front door and then you walk down basically a sloped wall and ceiling it's a funnel that gets you into the middle of the house and that's important because that's where all of the action happens. It's all against that. So you're looking back towards the front door here with a couple of coat closets on either side. But nonetheless, you know, it's atypical, uh, but it's different for a reason. Uh, we did not want to bring people in to see the private part of our house. 
And this is looking back out. Uh, again, I told you that the moon, it, it behaves on occasion for photographs. There it is, right on axis. Okay. Uh, one of the principal organizing elements of this house is a serpentine wall. And I call that because the wall kind of goes back and forth, snake-like, if you will. And on either side of that wall, it performs a function. So on the upper part where we have a bunch of books here, you can see that that's a pretty close to the kitchen. And those are my wife's cooking books. So there, she has immediate access to those. Then when it turns around and becomes a wall here, and you can see the vent, there's a return air vent, but on the other side, it's basically a recess into the dining room. So it's performing a function on both sides of that, and the return air vent is below that. Then there's additional books that are here. Here is the entry going between those, and then what you do is you see the representation of a thick wall, and then there are additional books that are here, and then as you come down, we have a recess for our TV, and on the far end, uh, because my wife, uh, like I said, plays the organ and we have a piano, all of her music books are down here. So we've double loaded this thick wall, so it's functional on both sides. We even run some of the plumbing and other things up inside this thick wall. This is looking down the hall, and uh, we have uh, a longer view here. We've terminated uh, that hall with round windows uh, on either end. This is down towards the music, and this is down towards the kitchen area. And then, as we would enter most every single day, is drive in, and uh, we put in a larger door so we could get things in and out. It's flat. In most uh, American, I think in other places too, they elevate the door from the garage into the house because they have construction for a crawl space and other structure for the floor. And uh, it's different from where the garage is. And also it's a good water barrier that you don't get water in the house, but ours is flat. So we come straight in and a larger door and then this is a resilient floor. And this is where a lot of action happens. You can go outside there or go up the stairs and the stairs are straight. They're intentionally straight because it's a lot easier to get furniture up and down. And the other kind of reason is that in our house, when we had our four daughters here, we would show slides and we'd sit on the stairs and it ended up being our seat. You know, it was uh, a way for us all to look against the wall and, and uh, enjoy that. So it double duty in that way. And they also like to kick off their shoes when they came in. So we put a place for them to put the shoes and be able to get those. And uh, so they're right there by the entry exit. The kitchen is important. Uh, like I said, my wife likes to cook. So um, this is wrapped around her and being able to put things together and, uh, you know, these are some of the things that she has put together. Why would I show those here? I'll show those because it's pretty important and we wanted to have a house that was wrapped around our lifestyle and even more in terms of food that uh, has been prepared. Now, another difference, and again, it's not necessarily uh, better, it's just different. Um, in the United States and probably other areas, uh, a great room is... Uh, thing that they design a lot of houses around. And the great room is a kitchen, dining area, and a living or lounging area, all kind of in the same space. Um, we live differently. We like smaller, more intimate spaces. So this is just off the kitchen, call it a reading room. You know, it's not intended to, you know, uh, tie in, but it's, it's there and we did not even have our TV there. You know, we've got it down at the other end. If you want to go watch it, then you got to go down to this room. So that's where the TV room, and it's small, it's intimate. Um, and uh, we use the thickness of the walls to store things. So we're using lots of things there. Um, another difference, uh, at least I came home from a trip 
And uh, the light here, this is a pendant light and then two sconces was broken. And apparently the cats were chasing some bugs and got up there and they knocked it down and they broke it. I could not find a replacement. Challenged uh, a local stained glass uh, uh, woman here and said, you know, can you design and build this? Uh, she did and that's what's there. And you can see a cat trying to be able to deal with that and uh, will not be able to change it. But it uh, actually improves things. Um, we would never have done this. The inspiration was because something was broken and we couldn't find another piece, but you know, went ahead regardless. Upstairs, same kind of pattern, books, and then you can see the stair. Now, we did not want to include flat skylights. You can see that uh, on the left-hand side. They tend to get dirt, and why would you want you know, where your light is coming in to be dirty. So we put in clear story lighting and there's a tower that allows natural light to come down inside. This is looking straight up and you can see how that spills into that area there and it illuminates, uh, you know, upstairs hallway uh, very well. We also have, you know, a laundry chute. It's open to everybody upstairs where our bedrooms are and, you know, things just come down right in there. So that makes it a lot easier. <clears throat> The bedrooms, they're in those two end areas that have high ceiling. And uh, we did not want to live in a basketball court. So built in that a uh, little <clears throat> loft area, cantilevered that out and put lights in it. So that uh, you know, in the master bedroom, and then this is in uh, our one of our daughter's bedrooms. She didn't sleep down here. She slept up in the loft, you know, so when she was in high school. And these are some of the reasons. It's the ceilings are about 5.2 meters high. And like I said, that's too much space. So we built this loft, can't leave it out. Didn't want end lamps here. So we can turn on the lights overhead and read. And uh, it also, uh, you know, provides another space up above. This is uh, morning light coming in. You can see, you know, why they're facing east and that. And then this is looking down from the loft into the master bedroom. This is looking behind that loft area. So it's all being used. You know, the, the walls are shaped around functions. And then there's a ladder and the ladder is even a little different. There are flat rungs going up this far because I'm stepping on them. And then there are round rungs up above. You won't step on these, but you grab them with your hand. So that ladder even changes form based on how you use it. Another thing is uh, storage. Uh, in the States, we tend to use our space overhead and these rickety ladders are difficult to get up and down. We said, we're not doing that. So we have a couple of closets in one of the rooms and you can see those here where the door is open, but there's another door in this one that one goes into a storage area, and this is the storage area on the right. And it's all on the same level. So we don't climb upstairs, we just store things in there. So it's a closet with a door in it and uh, allows us to be able to store things there. Another difference is in the back, in the patio area. <clears throat> uh, there's nothing against patio furniture, but it tends to blow around in the winter, it gets dirty, and uh, you have to store it sometime. So all of the spaces that are in the back in the patio area are built at seating height. So I don't have to have any extra furniture. You know, I can put plants or whatever. My wife does most of that. You can see how that's shaped around. Another thing in terms of lighting is, uh, again, it's different uh, simply because I don't like to look at light sources and, you know, the, they can cause you to squint and all things. So lower the light source and most all the light is reflected. You can see that it's reflective out here, it's reflected there, even in the fountain, it reflects off the bottom. Another difference um, on the left-hand side, uh, if I were to have enclosed all of that with a kind of trellis shape there, then it's too confining punch the hole in it so it gives you a little bit of a vista out the back. 
And likewise, the same is true with the shape here that there's a hole in it that allows you to see through it. Yet yeah, it still encloses the space. And then this is looking out. This is basically the view from the kitchen window. Wanted to be able, when my wife was in there, uh, look out and you know, see the enclosure of the plants and the fountain. The fountain was a little bit of a challenge too, uh, more than I guess I thought when I started it. Um, it has uh, an upper level for a lot of the electronics that need to be above the water, the lights and, and things like that. And then it has a, a drain hole that allows it to not ever get above that. <clears throat> But the base is made out of a polycarbonate, and then there's a, a large, thick uh, limestone that was shaped that's on the top. And you can see that, and how the light was intentionally going up through the stone and then also reflecting off the bottom and at different seasons, uh, showing it. And uh, it's a kind of a center point. Now, you can see it on axis with a kitchen right here, and that's what you pretty much see. But the other thing, it's the acoustic environment. Um, you can see a little bit of a crack in these windows. Those are operable windows. So the sound of the fountain goes into the house. And uh, I tried, I've got a valve on it to try to adjust it to uh, shape the sounds though, but it just sounds like a, a brook, a babbling brook. Now, <clears throat> early on, uh, living in Seattle, uh, we had a very small house and not enough room to have a workspace. So I was working out in the garage and this is it. You know, it's a hollow core door. I was able to get uh, a drafting machine from Boeing and you probably don't know what those are. <laughs> Using keystrokes to do it. And just, you know, uh, a very humble place in order to do drawings. But there's nothing wrong with that. I probably did some of my best work out there in the garage and, uh, you know, just around the boxes and uh, that kind of environment. So it's not that way anymore. In this house, uh, I've got a studio upstairs. I can sit down here. I've got north light, you know, over the drafting board in the same old drawing machine that I've got there. Downstairs, and you probably see a little bit of that, you know, behind me. This is, uh, you know, I have a sitting and a standing area for uh, working. How do you decide on some of the things that are very subjective, uh, kind of decor type thing? Um, in our family, uh, my wife introduced us to artichokes and we all loved them. So I thought, well, that's a pretty good theme. So I was able to sculpt a little artichoke have a cold cast and that now uh, the cabinet pulls, you know, so uh, that's kind of a theme. Now it's different, but it doesn't mean a store-bought one is any different or, you know, if you like lemons, you could do lemons or some other thing. But this was just a way for us to be able to bring something into our house that was part of our family. Another thing was the chevron pattern, uh, you know, it's, repeated in the wrought iron railing here, it's repeated in the entry brick, and it's repeated in the bamboo flooring that you can see there. That's a theme. <clears throat> the uh, shower upstairs has an operable window and it faces east. And that's how you can see like the sun going across the shower if you get up that late and see the sun. Another thing is, uh, the uh, chimney pots, uh, they typically look like the conventional one here and they're expensive. And uh, I thought, well, maybe I could design one, have it made for a lot less. And you see what I fashioned here. Uh, it has the same functionality, the air comes underneath and it blows up here and that's screened off at the top. And you can see these chimney pots, they cost a lot less and they were made out of the same kind of sheet metal that they make gutters out of. Uh, I went to a shop to do that. They were a little surprised because they typically don't do this kind of work, but nonetheless, they were able to do it. Here are a few miscellaneous things that are thrown in to you know, challenge architects. Uh, when Neil Armstrong died, I thought, well, it would be fitting to come up with some kind of uh, memorial for him in a, in a 
medallion type shape. The inspiration was from uh, the missing man formation. When a pilot dives, they'll fly a formation, but they leave out one. And it's an obvious graphic symbol of something missing. And likewise, uh, when a dignitary dies, a lot of times they'll have a horse. There's no rider on the horse and the boots are backwards. You know, So the missing element becomes the most important part of that. I took that theme and put it into an orbit. An orbit is continuous, but if you break it, it's discontinuous. So that space became the symbol for doing that. And in this particular case, the Earth is here. And then I was thinking each one of the astronauts uh, would be represented by what their career was. If they went to the moon, then like Neil Armstrong on the moon, he would be on the backside, but they could all be on the front side. So again, why is this different? These are the reasons why this is different. Um, I was looking at some furniture designs and a lot of times stacking lightweight furniture is good. No problems with that. But this particular piece is heavy it's made one off and it's kind of fanciful. As you might guess, it's a tutu, uh, you know, it has a uh, laminated wood and a little widow's peak at the top here for representing the hair. So yeah, it's, it's a fun piece, it has, uh, you know, uh, the ballerina shoes and all. So, uh, but that inspired me to do some other ones. And this may be a little bit English, but uh, <clears throat> if you know what a giraffe is, this was called a cheraf. And then there is a dog, it's a bull terrier. This is a bull chariot. And then this one on the far right represents uh, the griffin, which is a combination of an eagle and a lion. <clears throat> Another chair, um, this was more a, a prosthetic way of looking at it. I found this chair in New Orleans, I finished it, and then uh, I didn't want to restore it by putting in wooden styles in here. So I talked to a machinist, got some aluminum, and was able to put in the same form, but a different material. So the repair in not only the style, but also in one of the leg braces is uh, a different material, but the same form. Mm. Uh, when our children were little, was looking at alternatives to the conventional rocking horse. So why not a rocking zebra? Kangaroo, elephant, camel, lots of options. And they, those can, that could be fun. Uh, the Japanese uh, invited space architects to do birdhouses. Um, so typically, you see a birdhouse that's like that. And the size of the hole determines what kind of bird it is. So this was designed to change out to have different kinds of bird, probably not a penguin, but this is the concept. Uh, there is a plate that could have like over here some wood or it could be just metal and uh, be able to, uh, you know, have ventilation. The birds like the ventilation. And uh, the Japanese took this photograph. It's a fantastic photograph. But uh, the other, other part of this, since we were space architects, I wanted to reverse the thinking. Uh, a plumb bob or a device like this is only useful in the gravity environment, not in space. So uh, that may be esoteric, but nonetheless, that was part of the rationale. I was invited to do uh, the design of uh, a doctor's idea for migraine headaches. So conventionally, you'll take, you know, a syringe or you'll take pills and that's habit forming. But people who have migraines will do uh, a lot of things in order to relieve uh, the pain. And his concept was to have heat and cold. You choose which either one you wanted. And constriction, you tighten it up. So I went through a bunch of ideas and ended up with a concept. We got a patent on and we were producing and selling. But some of the difference was a front closure rather than a rear closure because our hands are in front. 
And then some of the same logic that we use when now they've embraced a lot of things in terms of a mesh that wicks away with sweat and gel packs that you can put in there that you can heat till it freeze and be able to manage it. Most of uh, the patients like this a lot. In fact, we did some clinical tests and it was very successful and published in uh, medical papers. I just want to show a few drawings. Uh, did this in Rome of a winemaker, a woman that I knew then. This is my dad. The thing that's different about this is that um, more time was spent on the cockpit than it was on him. And the reason was because that was his life. He was a pilot and uh, he flew in World War II and uh, then eventually was flying 747s for Boeing. But making this in a way that uh, the pilot would appreciate uh, was a real challenge. So uh, it's not just the portrait, it's more uh, embracing a career and being able to show that. The style is kind of loose, but it's very tight too. My daughter, my wife, and some of the things different about this is that <clears throat> typically you don't do you know, portraits and um, I'll consider work clothes, but the twisted part of her apron, the lighting on that, uh, you know, this seam kind of telegraphing through and the way that the light comes across the cushion and the cushion being deformed, you know, represents, uh, you know, sitting on it. Some cartoons uh, in summer space, some are not. Uh, and again, I sent the, the bottom one, Sandra. And this one up uh, in upper right there, the, uh, Huntsville is supposed to have the highest concentration of PhDs in the US. And that's what they say. So it affects the schooling and it affects the sport. So in this particular one, tried to represent rather than the painted bodies of the fans that, you know, a formula, F equals MA out there on the field. And then did some, some other drawings for children's book here. Now, this is my last chart. Uh, and I show it because what I have shown you previous to this is a whole bunch of stuff. Now you're being trained as architects. Here are some architects, Corbusier, Mies van der Rohe, Overalto, Hans Holbein, and Frank Gehry. They're images in terms of drawings, paintings, other things that they have done, other things that they have produced, furniture, you know, a vase, uh, plateware, a ring, you know, benches, things like that. Now, as architects, I want to challenge you you know, to expand your thinking, to be able to look at opportunities that are outside the conventional architectural solution. And that's what space architecture is to me. You know, uh, we begin to call ourselves space architects, but we're really architects and we're operating in the space environment and designing for the space environment. So I'll close on that one and uh, then open back up here and uh, entertain any questions that you have. Um, I was speaking without my microphone, so thank you for putting this together, especially. Uh, it was great to see your house. <laughs> yeah. and more of your works and how you, you I would say your design approach I, th I think in the beginning what we talked about it was it's interesting also probably for the students to see that many idea, many good ideas are already there or have already been there and usually are rediscovered a few times before they are actually built or realized. Um, maybe I start with Valentina. Valentina has a question on the habitation module. Um, yes, hello. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for the lecture and for uh, giving us an insight uh, of your ideas. Um, so when you spoke about the uh, habitation slash laboratory module, um, you told us that you took into consideration uh, the wish 
that the astronauts would have like a separate living space and working space. So I was just wondering um, how were you able to balance uh, their wishes and their actual needs um, to get like the best result because at the end, they're the ones who are living there who are gonna spend some time there. And I was wondering what was your main source of inspiration when you designed the module? That's an excellent question now. Uh, when architects are working on large projects like the space station, there are a lot of people and it doesn't go quickly. You will be fortunate if you can do it. I worked on space station for about 10 years from the very beginning and it still was going on. So sometimes you have a good idea, sometimes you can get it in there and it's based on the rationale. Like I said, the astronauts are the ones that said they wanted it that way. Obviously it didn't stick. What happened to space station was it came up to a point where in the United States, um, they weren't going to fund it anymore. So, it passed by one vote, but the reason that happened is they said, let's bring on you know, the Russians and be able to build it up that way. The whole design changed. So some of the things that you thought were important before, like you know, being able to separate the habitation areas from the laboratory area, went away. It ended up all being laboratories and they carved out spaces. So, uh, that's part of the process, and the process is very important. And uh, I think that's why when you see now in space, people like Elon Musk, they're able to pay out of their own pocket and they're able to streamline things. He doesn't have to go through a lot of approval processes and you can get a different result. So that's where the process and the result are just so important. And uh, I, I wish we had more control and. Now, there are lots of things that they complain about on space station that we had solutions for early on, but they just they went away. It was like trash or storage or things like that, you know. So uh, at this stage, people complain about it. But it was no surprise early on. It just didn't make it all the way to the final design. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Well, let me ask you, I mean, this is a, an odd collection of things. <laughs> you know, like I said, I haven't presented this material before. Uh, it's a little bit, you know, exposing. Uh, and some of it goes back. It could be very dated. The whole point was that how in our design process do we get things out there? And why should we limit it to just architecture? Do you have any comments? Could I ask the next question? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Um, I wanted to know more about the materials and layers in a spacesuit and uh, how does it exactly work and what does prevent the astronaut from freezing? Okay. Um, spacesuits uh, have several requirements. The first one, obviously, is to hold the pressure. So there is a bladder inside of the spacesuit that won't let the gas out. Another one is structure. Uh, it just can't go everywhere. So you want to retain that. So there's a structural layer. Then there are thermal layers. So they tend to put a lot of this stuff called multi-layer insulation, a lot of that in there. And then there's an outer layer that is there for abrasion, you know, when you brush up against something. It's a, a rough, you know, outer layer. So uh, it can be 11 layers, you know, thick. That's why the gloves are hard to move there. The gloves are pressurized and they have mm -hmm. lots of layers. Um, so uh, those are some of the materials they use, metals, when they connect it up, when you have a glove that you put on here. The helmet is changing in design, but there's a metal piece there, usually aluminum. And I'm trying to think of the conversion. It's probably around 140 kilograms. 
That's about what the suit weighs. You can't stand up on Earth. You know. But in the weightless environment, it, it, it doesn't weigh anything. It's just mass. Uh, and so it, they're pretty heavy. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the only thing that's keeping you alive is breathing the oxygen. They use oxygen and being able to control that. And, uh, you know, you've got to take up the carbon dioxide, too, because you're exhaling carbon dioxide. And mm -hmm. uh, actually, being in a suit, the hard part is sizing. You're a different size than I am. And, you know, everybody's different in your arm length, in your leg lengths, how tall you are. And um, you want your arm to bend where it's supposed to bend. And when that thing's inflated, it's like a, an automobile tire. It's really hard. So mm -hmm. uh, you've got to design the suit so they can size it for everybody that's going to go outside. That takes 12 hours on orbit. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, is that uh, you tend to work out. Um, so there's a undergarment that you wear that cools you. Um, you're like being in a thermos bottle and you're heating it up. So you have an undergarment that has tubes of cold water running through that to help cool you down. Um, they've had some problems. They've had water leak, and I did that cartoon. And if water leaks in the helmet, it's life-threatening because it's just floating around. It can short out your communications. It can get in your eyes. You don't know where you're going. So. Uh, you hope to have another astronaut there be able to get you back to the airlock. So there are lots of issues with spacesuits, um, and uh, that's why we're working on that spacecraft, the small spacecraft. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Is there any other question? Uh, I would have one. Please, um, So you mentioned um, about the ISS and some designs for the habitation of the astronauts. Um, that uh, their wish was to separate their off-duty work from the actual work or life and work. And uh, we all know in the pandemic how important it is for like a home office. So it's understandable. And then my question is, um, how much weight? Does it go into the opinions of astronauts? Since uh, normally architects uh, cater to the people using and living in those habitats and houses and buildings, but uh, I assume uh, in spacecraft it's a bit more complicated than that. Well, I, I'm gonna. I think I understand your question, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. But you know, uh, when you think about architects contributing to space, you have to think several different environments and they're different, they, they shape the solution. One is the weightless one like we have now, the space station. Another would be on the moon or another maybe on Mars. And there you have gravity. Uh, architects uh, can play a key role. Uh, and I think with now the number of people that are involved, uh, like Sandra and others that uh, are involved with space architecture, it's more recognized as a, a field that can contribute. But, and I think you've had presentations that show that architects now are working in an engineering environment. And it's not the other way around. You know, uh, Typically out in the commercial world, the architect gets the phone call when something goes wrong, you know, and <laughs> you tell your engineers what to do in order to be able to fix that. But in terms of shaping that, you kind of have to be a designer and you have to be a manager. You have to have several skills to be able to get your product completed. But uh, some of the exciting things, like I mentioned, the neutral body posture. Another thing that uh, is interesting in just the physics of it, that there's no convection in the weightless environment because there's no difference in terms of the weight of the gases. So here we have a natural, you know, 
convection. The, the warm air rises, the cool air goes down, we have a separation, and we don't have to worry about that. In space, if you didn't have ventilation, you'd build up this little bubble of heat around you. Your carbon dioxide would be right there in front of you. So you have to wash that away. So architects for space design have to be concerned about how to manage airflow. Not like you would on the Earth, but that's very important. It's life critical in space. So there are some issues there that change as a result of the physics of being in space. And, uh, you know, we, we looked at all kinds of things early on and we recruited uh, specialists that would say, well, is there a psychological impact due to color? You know, and, and what color should we pick? And uh, if you look at the inside of the space station, it probably doesn't matter. <laughs> you don't get much of that. But we even had, you know, other reasons. Like there are traditional colors for, you know, like oxygen is green, you know. Or you may want contrast for a handrail against the background. You want to be able to see it you know, because that's how you get around in space. So that contrast is important. Uh, but uh, Ultimately, I don't think much of the color got in there. They do, at the end cones, have different colors that are supposed to represent the modules. But um, we looked and tried to find reasons for putting color in there. But there's all kinds of things that uh, traditionally in an architect's office, you maybe wouldn't spend that amount of time. But you want to bring in an expert to be able to help you out for space. Does that help with your question, or did I miss it? No, definitely help. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other question? Uh, Brent, I have a question. Okay. Because uh, you have shown this uh, circular model of space station freedom, the configuration yes. that was circular, and also that there was a habitation module and uh, working, in, you mentioned working in a hallway. I would like to ask you if you can summarize why you think these design decisions had been skipped? Or it's not just because of money, probably. Part of it's money. It is, if you bear with me, I'll explain the logic. <clears throat> um, they started off saying, we're going to build the space station using the shuttle. So you have to use the cargo bay of the shuttle. And that's about 4.5 meters, 5 meters in diameter. Okay? So that, this, that determines the outside dimension. The length then is variable. But the shuttle can only launch so much. And another condition is that when you're launching the shuttle, they wanted to be able to abort and land. So the center of gravity of the shuttle on the way up had to be so that they could fly it and glide it down. Now, you put those together and you can't fill up that whole cargo bay. You can put together a module, and once you filled it with its basic subsystems, there's very little outfitting. And by outfitting, I mean racks that you can put in there. So the shuttle would go up and down and would carry more racks to outfit the whole space station. So the rack determined the size of the hatchway. It determined the architecture in terms of putting things in there. And it's a very heavy solution because each one of those racks has structure, has to withstand, withstand launch and everything else. So it ended up to be where I have to bring a rack in and I have to put it in place. So now you're beginning to see why it's shaped the way it is. The four quadrants are all the same, you know, top, bottom, and the two sides, they're the same. But that only leaves the center place 
And that's where you work, that's where you live, and that's where the crew translates. Uh, they're not very deep, they're, they're deep enough for a crew quarter, but we have different schemes. And uh, in fact, uh, I'm, I'm more in favor, especially with a, uh, you know, habitat module that we bring in the Iowa to be about a meter and then let the rest of it be uh, enclosed spaces for like a crew quarter or a gallery room, wardroom or something like that. Um, so you can kind of see that in order to completely outfit the space station over time, uh, we had to have a pathway to bring up the racks and put them in place. That's that left the, the open space to be where the crew is. Uh, all right. Is there any other question concerning that topic? Because then, Brent, we do what we talked. What uh, was the question you wanted to ask the students? Well, I just, uh, you know, uh, I want to inspire them to uh, be able to do some of the stuff that's, that's represented on the screen right there. Um, and don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't be afraid. You know, none of us would be in space architecture if we didn't pursue that. It wasn't a career path. It's not like there's a sign up there that says space architect wanted. It doesn't exist. You kind of have to, you know, force your way into it. Now, I'm not talking about being a rebel. I'm just saying be persistent, you know, and be able to uh, work within what that environment is like. Uh, for the longest time, people didn't know I was an architect, you know, uh, it, it wasn't important, you know, let me do the work. Um, but when it was significant to Boeing, then they, they started calling me, you know, they're a space station architect and things like that. But uh, before you kind of have to survive in terms of their world and doing what they want. And uh, that's okay. I mean, if you want to do it. You're probably not going to change it. Maybe later on, but uh, right now, no. So, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunities for architects. Um, I don't know what the attrition rate is, but it's pretty high. You know, for those that get out of school with an architecture degree, that end up practicing architecture after 20 or 30 years. So, a pretty small number. Uh, go different places. But there's no better education, in my opinion, than architecture. It's humanities, it's science, it's building. And, you know, for the most part, I think we got to be builders. We got to create things. Uh, and it's okay to do papers and all kinds of other things like that. But, you know, you got to build some stuff. You know, that's, that's important. Uh, Brent, what about um, Manny Lieben? What about we use the breakout session now for three, four minutes? And with the question, how do you think, how can architects make a difference? We let the students discuss, Brent, in, in, smaller, in smaller groups. And with the question, how architects can make a difference. For three minutes, what do you think? Or okay. five? Okay. Three or five? Yeah. What's the answer? Are you looking to me? Uh, any students can choose. <laughs> Whoever will five. speak up. Five, then I put you in the breakout sessions. How many people in a breakout session? Five? Four. Okay, that's nine. Um, aut automatically, perfect. Uh -huh. Okay, four minutes, five minutes. Uh -huh. Meeting. Oh. 
Okay, so it should work now. That means uh, see you in five minutes. And I thank you, Brent. Stay online, but I'm closing the YouTube live stream. Okay. So how do you want to, after our break,